Okay. Hi guys. You barely see the screen. Um, I'm gonna be carving some blanks. I think this is. I might lower this just a little bit. Um, maybe it'd be better if it was lower. And then tilt it up a little bit. Um, don't hesitate to uh, holler out if you have any questions. I think I'll be able to see everything. Um, it's getting cold, so I'm gonna. Okay, I'm making spoon blanks today. Uh, it's going to be a mix of cherry and birch um, and a mix of shapes. And these are for customers who uh, order spoon blanks and they they come in two different types, but I'm only making one type in this video. Uh, the two types are finished blanks that are ready to go, and then raw blanks where there's still some axe work that needs to be done. Um, and that it has the, the crank cut into it. Like I said, guys, uh, there's a lot of glare, so I can't see much, so I'll keep zooming in my face to check on uh, whether you guys have any questions. But in the meantime, I'll just narrate what I'm doing. So I always start with a length of wood that's longer than what I need. Um, and that allows me to stay back from my hands about like this. You can see that I'm using the palm of my hand here. Is this, um, is this uh, a good angle for you guys or is it difficult to see stuff? Would it be better if it was that better um, at any rate this allows me to keep this far away from my hand when I'm using the axe now the two most common things that I see that are problems when people come take lessons and they learn how to use an axe number one is they go too fast you'll notice how slowly I'm going just whack 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 I'm not going whack 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 I'm not trying to do that it's exhausting you end up making mistakes both in terms of what you're cutting and dangerous mistakes in terms of being sloppy around your body. So go nice and slow. Um, so that's thing number one, is to act probably slower than you think you should. And you'll notice how I'm going back and forth and creating a valley in the wood, right, like this. and. This part is going to be the bowl, and then this is going to be the handle from here down to here. Um, and at this point, I'm just starting up here and easing this down so that I'm creating one fluid line down to that deepest point. Now, keep in mind that that deepest point is not going to be the center of the bowl. That's actually going to be the shoulders where the neck is. Um, oh, good, Ty. You can see fine? Okay. So... Now that I have the length that I want, I'm going to cram the shape of the bowl onto one side of that. And then right where it flips, that's where my neck is. Or sometimes a little closer, you know, sometimes a little bit further up the bowl, but in this case it's right at the neck. And I draw a center line. And then I draw the handle. I like to have the handle flare on either side of the center line as it gets down towards the end. And that way I can split off the sides of the handle quite easily and effectively. Um, okay, with something like this that has a real triangular back, I could just put it right here and saw. But if I take a moment and just flatten the back, it makes it much easier to saw. So the other thing you'll notice is how far up I'm choked on the axe. I'm not right up here because you really do lose some power and it gets uncomfortable, but I'm not back here. If you're back here, you're using way too much force. So right here where your thumb is maybe an inch away from the head itself is where you want to be. And you'll notice that the my motion is a waggly motion. There's almost, you know, if I'm back here, I might be using my, I might ease back on the handle a little bit and use a little more of my elbow for some of these cuts where I'm not worried about being close to my body but as soon as 
I do anything other than something like this, you'll see me choke back up and start making all those cuts just from waggling my hand. Any questions so far? Um, sorry if I missed your questions. Like I said, I can't really see very well. Um, okay, so now that I have it trimmed to size, so this, if I trim this to length, this would be what I'd call a rough blank, where it still needs all the axe work around the outline, but the crank is done and the outline's drawn. Um, so I have five different hand saws. This one, I guess I'll introduce all of them. This one is my old favorite, the ARS little folding saw. All of my saws are 35, 25 to 35 dollars. And I put a fresh blade in this one and all the other ones are fresh blades so I'm able to do some comparisons. And I have to say, this one still is my favorite. But there are some distinctions of the other ones that I'll, that I'll talk about. But, you know, this one's about 25 bucks. It cuts like a dream. You want to make sure that you get a saw that has a straight blade so that uh, you're less prone to overcutting in the back. See how I, I came right up close to where I want to be? And if this is a hooked blade, then it is difficult to uh, judge how far it's cutting in the back and you're much more prone to overcut in the back. So, so this cherry log has been sitting around for a year now, but it's the sapwood still has a lot of moisture in it, which is why I'm drawn with a Sharpie. If I was doing all work with heartwood, I could draw with a, a Bic, but with the sapwood, it's useful to have it be a Sharpie. Now, so that right there is why I flare the handle, because um, I can split it and the grain runs down and comes right to my notch. In that case, on the other side, it doesn't quite. And this is where, any questions so far? This is where I think the key thing that I would recommend you practice doing comes into play, which is that uh, I think a lot of times people think of carving with axes as, as like um, as like carving, that you're making these cuts with the axe. Um, and I would, uh, I would encourage you guys to think about it more as splitting. That what you're trying to do is you're trying to pop off wood in a controlled fashion so that uh, it pops off without your blade ever being in danger of whacking on the back of the shoulder here. Um, so what that looks like, A, is don't sharpen your axe so much. Um, you want it to be slightly, I'm not going to say dull because you want it to bite in successfully, but... Um, if your axe is so sharp that it is actually sticking in the wood and not letting the wood pop off in chips, then that's too sharp. Um, and then I would say when you are carving, I'm sorry, when you're, when you're axing, try to uh, let your axe be like a trip hammer it's just making the same motion over and over and over again and you're moving the you're moving the spoon underneath it to achieve the different curves that you want um, and also that means that the axe is hitting the same place if you want it to hit the same place it can hit the same place again and again and again and that allows you to chase a chip down um, but by thinking of the axe as splitting rather than cutting, you can think about how you basically are leaning into each cut and then you're anticipating when the wood pops off. That's absolutely key. Um, you couldn't agree more. You recently discovered that. You leave your axe slightly dull. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's all about when you see this happening, what's happening there is not so much that I'm making a cut down, what's happening is that I'm doing a, basically a controlled split where I'm um, controlling how much is being split off by each blow. And again, nice, slow, even blows. And then that's about where I leave a spoon blank. Uh, it gives me plenty of wiggle room to chase the perfect shape inside of that. Um, and it'll be pretty efficient to carve. Um, 
Okay, so I'm doing just a mix of shapes for this customer. So, uh, let's see here. I find it works just fine to split with the axe um, rather than use a fro. You know, the axe works very well to split wood up to a certain amount. And beyond that amount, it's probably good if you weren't splitting it anyways. And I find the club absolutely essential for that. My club is just a real simple birch log, saw it around the handle, carved it down. Um, and then over here, you guys aren't going to be able to see it, but over here I have a little low bench. And the low bench is key for helping keep things organized and up off the ground because uh, otherwise stuff gets lost pretty easily. Okay, so uh, the fun part about doing blanks for people is getting to decide which way to orient a spoon within the log. Um, but again, leaving that distance between where I'm working and where my hand is is absolutely key. And if you aren't comfortable with and absolutely certain of where your axe is going to hit, don't try and hit at the top where you're going to start all at once. Um, start down and walk your way up once you've basically got the range of, of where you're trying to go. There's a comment here I should read. Any advantages or disadvantages to making a stop cut around the neck? Aside from not splitting the bowl, when axing you find you have a smoother transition from bowl to handle when you don't make a stop cut. Um, that's probably true if your neck, uh, well, if you have trouble making a stop cut too deep, then certainly not making stop cuts is a good first step to sort of backing off a little bit and assessing it. I find it advantageous to make a stop cut because it allows me to split down the wood of the handle, which on larger spoons is particularly advantageous in terms of the amount of time that I save. Um, now, it is a point of failure for me. It's one of the areas where it's, you know, I'm most likely to screw it up by oversawing the stop cut or by not paying attention to the grain and splitting down to the bowl. So, yeah, you, you will screw it up more. That being said, for me, where I'm trying to be as efficient in my timing as possible, it is a big savings on timing. Um, both when I'm preparing the blank and also when I'm carving because I'm much more likely to get real close to, uh, I'm much more likely to, to get real close to the neck the way I, I want it. I think it's, um, you know, for a neck that has a real pleasing shape, you're actually getting pretty tight in there. Um, all right, so what are they going to describe? Hold on, there was something. Um, can't remember. Okay, I'll be doing this for a while. So, here I am doing a serving spoon. I've recently come to really like serving spoons that basically have the same shape as my eaters, just everything's scaled up. So, the handle is similar, but the whole thing, instead of being 8 inches long, is maybe 9 inches long. So it's, it's funny, when you hold one next to the other, when they're in blank form, you think, gosh, is there really a difference between them? But then once they're actually carved down to their final shapes, you realize, yep, there's a big difference. Uh, what else about carving or about using a stop cut or not? Um, well, uh... I was going to say. So this saw is a Baco saw, which has a different tooth pattern. Almost all of the ones that I have have a tooth pattern like this, and the Baco has a different tooth pattern. Um, and what that means is that it doesn't cut quite as aggressively, but it, it engages more easily. And so for a beginner, someone who's not familiar with how these saws feel, this saw might be a better choice because it would it just starts more smoothly and one of the things I've noticed in my lessons is that people who are unfamiliar with using a saw like this 
they really struggle with sawing because they're trying to push the blade too hard, too fast, or they're twisting the blade, or they're just, I don't know, lots of different ways. And I think this saw might be more forgiving than some of these more aggressively toothed saws. And it still cuts super fast. Um, the handle's also straighter than most of the other saws, which for this purpose I think is totally fine. And it's Baco, so it's, it's well made, but it's not expensive. Um, Any questions right now? No other questions as far as I can see. I'm sorry if you asked a question and I just didn't look up and see it in time. Like I said, the glare is terrible. Um, so, hold on, there's something I wanted to share about axing. Oh, so one of the things that I've come to realize about axes is... Um, Almost more important than how heavy the axe is, is how uh, how centered the handle is in terms of the weight. If there's as much weight back here as there is here, then you're able to do this quite easily. Whereas on something like this, like the Robin Wood axe, even though it's lighter than this Grand Furs Brooks axe, um, because the weight isn't as balanced, there's more weight on this side definitely than there is on this side of the handle when my hand is here. Uh, torquing the blade, even though it's a lighter axe, just takes more effort. And because my style of splitting the wood rather than carving the wood basically requires that I, I lean in to every cut, right? So I'm slightly twisting the axe like this with every cut so that I'm actually angled this way as opposed to being angled down. Um, it's actually easier to do with this axe because the angling is uh, very easy because the whole thing is balanced. Is there a good reason to carve bark side in? You mean to carve down through the bark? I like to carve down through the bark because then you get the beautiful circles within the bowl. So if I'm gonna carve tangentially split wood that's like that, then I'll do it that way. If you carve like a half a branch where you start with the bark side on the underside, you end up with that funny thing where you have uh, lines up here and then lines down here, and then this amorphous thing in the middle. I don't like it as much as having concentric circles. Um, so that's why I do it. I also think that it's marginally less strong, although I think it's perfectly possible to carve a spoon that's strong enough that it'll never have any problems. Um, so, so you'll see I'm just twisting just the slightest bit. And I think this is key. When, when I watch people have trouble and when they almost bash into here with the axe edge, uh, it's because they start off dug in, but then they let the axe, they don't keep it digging in with each bite. They let the axe pivot so that it starts to go down. And then they usually are going too fast and too hard and they end up bashing right here. And even if they pull up in time, if there's a crack there that has created a stress fracture within the wood, as the wood dries out, a crack will open up. Um, and so uh, that, you know, by angling the axe with every cut, you make it so that there's at no point is the edge of your axe actually pointed towards the shoulder of the spoon. And so you just eliminated that whole problem from ever being a possibility. It's really makes a lot of sense. Um, there's another point I wanted to make. Think of it. So you can see I'm just doing tiny little cuts and then rolling the spoon down and away to get these curved cuts on the outside. Um, okay, this part right here at the neck is, uh, uh, wow, it's hard to see what's, um, there we go. This part right here at the neck is easier to get if you uh, support the neck on the edge of the stump here, and then you can get right down into it with the axe. Um, again, nice and slow. Um, if you're having trouble going too fast, think about it as you want roughly the same speed as you would do CP CPR at, which is uh, 
Um, the one, the ha, 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 staying alive, staying alive. Right, so that kind of, hmm, just what you do CPR at is, is the perfect speed for doing an axe, axing in blank. Uh, here's my other piece. Okay, this piece is so wide that I'm tempted to try and split it in half and we'll see uh, if I can get two things out of it. If I can't get two things out of it, no harm done. I'll certainly be able to get one thing out of whichever piece turns out to be wider. So it's worth taking the gamble. There we go. Let's talk stumps for a second. I like my stump to be soft wood because I found that hardwoods particularly cherry is what I've tried, uh, cherry bounces. And so if your ax comes off your blank, hits the stump and then bounces, all of a sudden that ax is in play in a way that you can't anticipate. So it's actually quite dangerous. Um, so this is just a pine round, it's getting quite chewed up, but it does mean I can sink my ax into it quite handily uh, without, um, without having any problems there. So now I'm just uh, looking at where any cracks might be here so that I can eliminate them from the blank before I figure out what I want to do with it. Um, and then here's the other thing I would say. If you have a piece of wood and one side is has some gnarly bit and then the other side is smooth grain, put the handle on the smooth grain because you're going around and around in circles in the center of the bowl. You can handle grain that's swirling there in a way that it's much more difficult to handle grain that's swirling in the handle. Um, so again, start low, walk your way up to where you want to be, and then walk that cut down so that I'm hitting the same place every time and just slowly peeling it away. You'll see that this hand is safely out of the way. You'll see that I'm working to the side of my body, so if this comes down, I'm not going to hit my leg. I'm not going to hit my femoral artery or whatever that is there in my leg. Um, it can also be safer if you have a tendency of using more force than you really ought to. Try sitting down and using a low stump next to you. Um, that can help uh, short circuit the part of you that really wants to wail away at something. There's very few instances where you need to wail away at a big block of wood. Um, that might be disappointing to some of you guys, but uh, it is really, to my mind, fairly gentle activity. Um, which is good. It means you can do it all day if you need to. So you can see how I got this initial cut to shave in by, um, oh yeah, how deep is that initial, oh, this initial cut here, it really just has to do with what I want the crank to be. But the trick is to imagine not the crank as it appears like this, but the crank as it appears once I lower this face down just a little bit. Um, so that will exaggerate the crank. So I don't need to make as deep a crank in that first cut as I want in the end because this second cut that brings the top of the handle down is going to exaggerate the angle of the crank. The nice thing about doing the crank first in the process is that there are fewer surprises. You can examine the rest of the blank and say, okay, is there going to be room given that I have this you know, narrowness here? Is there room within this blank for the spoon that I want? Not just in this dimension, not just looking at it from here, but looking at it from all sides and looking at where there's knots and stuff. And sometimes you can anticipate that and orient it to take advantage of placing knots exactly where you want them. If you want to keep them, like this one I have in the center of the bowl, or avoiding knots if you want to try and make it so a knot falls to one side of the handle. You know all that information by doing the crank first. And so you don't get stuck halfway through a spoon with a situation that you couldn't anticipate and then you have all these sunk costs already in making the spoon and you're tempted to continue going even though you feel like you shouldn't because who knows what's going to happen and if that sounds familiar, this might be for you. Okay, this one, I want to do a spatula shape for this person. Um, one of the fun things about trying out, uh, or about making blanks for other people is that I try out shapes that I don't get to uh, do.
do myself uh, just because during the week I'm mostly carving spoons that people have already ordered. So unless I decide to make something for a weekend special or somebody requests something that I haven't made before, I tend to be making similar forms, uh, which I quite like, but it's also really nice to have these blanks that I'm making to practice drawing different forms and get a sense of you know what seems like it's going to work really nicely and what's not. Um, that's really helped me over the years with uh, refining the, sh the different outlines and shapes that I do use. Oh, okay, so this saw is a Corona professional razor tooth saw, and I would say this one is my next favorite saw behind the ARS, the, my original little one with the red plastic handle. It has a similar hook to the end of a fairly straight handle, so you can use it like this, or you can also back your hand up to that hook and get real nice pulling power. Um, what's this question? Why is the rooster not sing anymore? There is a rooster in the background singing. Um, we did slaughter our two extra roosters though, so that's probably why you're hearing few, fewer. So the thing I like about this saw is it's like the ARS saw, it is neither too aggressive nor too fine. It does just the right amount of cutting for this setup. And it's on the inexpensive side, which I'm always a sucker for. Uh, feels really good quality though, I have to say. Nothing, nothing cheap about this. Really good blade. All right. So now, um, unless it's really thin, if the wood is quite thin, then I might lift it up and do that. But if it's not thin, I almost always use the club. Because it's just more controlled. Now, here's a situation where I could tell that this line is going right down to that saw mark. In fact, it's actually gone, uh, it's hard to tell whether it would come out at that saw mark or not. But before it goes that far, I'm gonna just Slip the saw into the cut, do the tiniest, there we go, tiniest little thing. And that way, I make sure that it doesn't split down into the, um, into the bowl of the, the spatula, the blade of the spatula there. So, when you do your splitting down the handle, it's helpful, first of all, to tilt, tilt your spoon on the side so that just by having your axe straight up and down, it's already cocked in a little bit. So it's helpful if your stump is uneven and has you know a high bit that you can prop it at an angle on because quite frankly, cocking it and doing it like this, it's just, it's just harder. So tilt your spoon at an angle and then you can go straight up and down. And then what you wanna anticipate, you wanna gradually get the experience of anticipating which cut it's gonna finally break free on. And you want to basically uh, do that swing, but with less force. And then almost, uh, you're like doing a swing that has a hard stop. Not because you hit something hard at the bottom, but because your physical thing stopped it right there. I don't do that for every swing, but for that last swing where I anticipate not wanting to go further, that's a really important skill to develop. So you're not going to have that right away because it's, something that you develop over time. It's a relationship with the tool, it's a relationship with the wood and the particular tree that you're working with, but anticipating when it's gonna break through and stopping that cut that happens right after it breaks through is absolutely key. Um, both not doing a cut after that cut and also the cut that breaks through, stopping it by having a, a hard stop to your, to your hand there. Any questions, guys? No, nothing yet. Um, again, sorry if I missed your questions. I can't see anything for the glare. So I check in occasionally. All right, you'll also notice that my stop cuts are a bit away from the actual outline. That's because when you're coming up with your knife, your knife needs some wood within which to twist its tip, otherwise, uh, you're going to end up digging further into the neck or further into the shoulder of the bowl. Um, so don't put your stop cut right up on the line. 
because then uh, you're not giving yourself space to do that. You need space for your knife to go from being horizontal to then come up and be vertical and start going up the handle before it hits this saw cut right here. Um, okay, that's that. What should I make with this guy? So to, to some extent, if I'm making a, something with a piece of wood that has a, a thinner end, and a fatter end. I'll orient the spoon on the fatter end and that gives me more room to tip the bowl of the spoon down in by making these crank cuts here. You see how my fingers are held stiffly out and back here. They're not wrapped around where I could hit them with the axe. Always be aware of what the axe could do. Um, now, every single one of us Especially if you're using an axe that has a, a curved blade as opposed to those English style ones that have the straight blade. Um, every single one of us is going to axe more on one side than on the other. Uh, it depends on whether you're righty or lefty. Um, and I used to think that it was the same for every righty and lefty, but I think it has more to do with just sort of whether you lean over your blank more or whether you lean back from your blank more. But you're going to end up not making a symmetrical cut. You're going to angle it more on one side or the other. That's not a problem, you just need to anticipate that you're going to do that and compensate for it so that you end up you know, with cuts that are equal on both sides. Um, but what am I using? This is cherry right now. This is uh, this beautiful cherry tree uh, that came down a tornado this time last year and the slope above my house is probably seven or eight trees each one 50 to 80 feet long of clear trunk because it was a forest that they matured in. Um, so I've got cherry till the cows come home as long as I'm willing to trudge up the hill and get it. It's on my neighbor's land, but they don't have a use for it. And they've got lots of little kids, so they're happy to have me get it up and out of there. But I've literally got years worth of cherry to harvest. So. The other thing you want to do is, you know, match uh, the type of spoon and how much crank it has uh, to the billet of wood. So this billet of wood is quite shallow, doesn't really have much room for, um, for crank. So I'm going to try something a little different here and do a... Uh, Let's see, how do I want to do that? There we go. Do kind of like a little short spatula um, with it, right? Um, all right. All right, next saw. This is a Castellari saw. It comes, it's the only one that I bought that's not a folder, and I, I decided to get it anyways. It has a little plastic sheath. Nice sheath. Uh, I decided to get it anyways because it has a straight blade. It's only a little bit longer than some of these other straight blades. And so, like the others, it wouldn't be as prone to cutting through in the back. Now, it does have this very angled handle, which is less useful. Uh, I think, I mean, it's you could cut quite comfortably like this, but... For some of the cuts that I do, and the blade works quite lovely. For some of the cuts that I do, uh, I don't know. I'm used to I'm used to um, I'm used to holding the saw up like this. I think it helps me get this stop cut right here, and that's harder to do with this pistol pistol grip style here. I can still hold it, but it feels like this is somewhat useless in that regard. Um, similar to doing this cut here. I'm, I'm not holding back here on the pistol grip. I'm, I'm holding up here. Uh, but good saw. Also inexpensive. Uh, blade feels a slightly more aggressive than the Corona and the ARS, but, but pretty nice. Um, and then the pistol grip is pretty nice when doing just those cuts straight across. Any questions, guys? 
Your ability to draw a freehand and symmetrical is pretty cool. Thank you. Um, was that Neil? That was Neil. Um, thanks, Neil. Uh, yeah, that's something that I just developed over time. Um, I'm not really an artist. And boy, I have to say, when I do teach artists, <laughs> their ability to, you know, to just have me say, okay, draw, you know, a symmetrical spoon. And you can always tell somebody who is like truly trained as an artist because it is just not a problem for them. Um, I would say trickier than drawing this symmetrical is to be able to look at a shape that you've carved and see what in it needs to change in order to bring it into symmetry. That, that took a lot longer to develop. Um, and, you know, probably the, the cheap and easy way to develop that ability is just doodle spoons a lot. Um, I can't say I doodle spoons a lot now, but I certainly have gone through phases where I did. Um, now, it is a different thing to draw a spoon on a piece of wood that has a crank in it. Uh, it. It feels pretty different when that pen dips down into the wood than it does drawing on a flat sheet of paper. So be prepared for that to feel different. But it's still probably a worthwhile exercise. Okay. I'm actually a big fan of these kind of spoon spatula hybrids. I just find them so useful at every step of the way. Okay. Now going down the back of the handle here, um, while you could start up here and you know force your way down and do the little thing where you lay the ax down, you can also pop off the wood at the bottom and in the middle and then walk your way down. And by breaking it up into thirds like that, it's just a lot more controlled. When you lay the ax down like that, you never quite know what's going to happen because you're essentially sort of slow motion splitting the wood then instead of popping it off the way I do uh, when I break it up into thirds. That's much more of a sort of shocking the wood fibers and getting them to split apart, which on that small scale is much more predictable what they're going to do. Okay, so let's talk scoops for a second. Um, and I should also, all right, so oftentimes my wood is just in pieces that are that are this long and if I want a scoop the easiest thing to do is to put an eating spoon at one end and a scoop at the other end or do a scoop and then another scoop because uh, having a longer piece of wood that you can have the scoop attached to while you're sawing the stop cuts and all that just makes life a lot easier but every now and then you end up with a short chunk of wood that's too good to get rid of and you want to make scoops from it so how do you do that safely? Um, well, uh, starters, I like to split it down as much as is realistic so that I'm only handling what I need to handle. And that helps me keep my motions gentle. I find that the, the dangerous point is when you think you need to use a lot of force with an ax. Um, so, okay, so now I have this bit here. Now, if I were to do it this way, I would just end up with a, a radially split scoop without really any circles in the bowl. It'd be okay. It wouldn't be awesome. If I do it this orientation, because of the way that the grain is going this way in concentric circles, we will end up with some off-center circles in the bowl, which will look totally rad. So, um, again, if you're not sure where you're going to start, start low and walk up. You'll notice that my thumb is not here on the edge, but way back. Can you guys see that in the thing? can't tell how much you guys are actually able to see. Please let me know if, if this is too low and I need to lower the, the angle of the camera. So. You see how gentle this axe cut is? I'm basically lifting it about this. A good rule of thumb is never let your axe blade be up over your hand. 
Um, so super gentle. And I'm just hit by hitting in the same spot every time. I'm walking a cut down. And I'm maybe, as I'm getting down to the cut, maybe using my elbow a little bit to put some force behind it. Just like that. Now I'll come at it from the other direction, but I can stay back a little bit because I don't need this whole length. If I have the scoop bowl up here, I only need to have the handle go to about here. Um, I'm good. Okay, good. Uh, so again, start low, walk my way up, and then keep hitting the same spot and walk my way down. Now, if you're like me, and you like to have your scoops have... Uh, a pretty level rim, but then have a handle that kind of sticks up so it's easy to grab. Then the trick to doing that is within, you know, the most economically small piece of wood is to, similar to my bowls, to have all of the, uh, you're just overthinking the rough out. Yeah, you know, uh, I would say d don't underthink things that are that are safety oriented, but then a lot of stuff, yeah, you, it's, I know I certainly overthought a lot of stuff. Um, so put your bowl of your scoop all the way on one side. And then what you're going to see is that instead of having this be level, this is going to be level. And that naturally pops up the handle um, from the level rim. So again, find a center line in the bowl has really helped me stay symmetrical and I find handles that flare out are always as they reach the tip of the handle are always easier to carve because it's real obvious which way the grain needs to go. Now the tricky thing with a scoop like this is that there's not much to hold on to when you're doing your sawing and all these pieces of wood down here. There's not much to hold on to. So this is an instance when a saw like the Baco, which is less aggressive but also smoother cutting, is really your friend. Because you see how it's able to get into that saw cut without any chattering. And that really helps because I'm there's not much for my body to be pressing down on here. In terms of this piece of wood, there's not much friction between it and the stump. So a smooth cutting saw is really helpful in these circumstances. Um, whereas with something where you had more to hold on to, I'm having trouble getting this edge started. It's all chewed up back here. You know, a more aggressive saw might pull on the piece of wood more and would cause it to twist around more as I'm trying to cut it. So I have to say, you know, Baco is a really good brand. I prefer Baco pruners and ARS pruners to really any other pruners when I, that I've tried for my Christmas trees, um, where I make wreaths in the, in the winter. So I use the pruners all day, every day. And Baco pruners, man, they're just standard, professional grade stuff that doesn't have any bells or whistles. It's just good. Well thought out. Okay. So now, I've got my spoon blank, and, I'm sorry, my scoop blank, and then I'm going to use this to split off the sides. But because this is pretty short, the trick is to be super gentle here, because otherwise, your momentum will carry you down and into that shoulder below. Um, let's see. Hold on, hold on. Oh, yeah, of course, Maurice. Uh, how deep are the wood chips under my feet? Oh, gosh. Uh, I mean, there's a pile that the stump is on that's probably two feet, and probably I've got about eight inches to a foot under my feet, depending on how much I kick around. And it extends over this entire bit. There's some spots back there where there aren't any. I really need to, to muck it out. Um, we burn a lot of it in our our fire pit, but... Uh, just haven't done it yet. Haven't mucked it out. It's always felt like something that didn't need to happen. But pretty soon it's going to need to happen because we're going to need to get this greenhouse up and running for the gardening season. Someday I'll have 
a workshop and uh, that I will keep cleaner and hopefully be able to heat with all of these wood scraps that I'm creating. That would be a nice synergy. So again, I'm using the club to make really accurate cuts on the back there to knock those corners down um, before I start rounding from the middle. Now, it is possible with a scoop to make it too shallow. Uh, with a scoop, you tend to, you should really give yourself a little more depth than you than you think right off the bat you're going to need because you never quite know how much depth you're going to be able to achieve on a scoop. Um, depends on how well the wood's behaving itself, how sharp your knife is, what the radius of your knife is versus the radius of the bowl of the scoop that you're trying to carve. So, good rule of thumb is give yourself a little extra cushion on scoops. They're so small that it's pretty easy to carve down the extra with a knife. Um, okay. That's a little lopsided. But I think it's easy enough to fix. tend to not worry too much about spoon blanks that are lopsided so long as there is enough wiggle room within them to get a nice shape. So like this spoon blank is a little bit lopsided, um, but there is room within it for a really nice symmetrical shape like that. And this extra bit here is just so much easier and uh, more accurate to remove with a knife that there's no point in me trying to remove it now. Chances are that I would screw it up is just, it makes it not worth, not worth trying to do. Okay, working my way through this cherry round. That's five blanks done. Let's see, I guess it's time to do some eaters. So... Whenever I'm splitting up a piece of wood, you know, I'm trying to match what I need to get out of it with what I, what it has to offer in terms of being cool. Um, and I find the times that I, that things go wrong is when I try and squeeze too much out of it. You know, when I'm trying to squeeze, uh, I'm splitting the wood down too fine. That's when I end up wishing that I hadn't. Um, but in this case, if I'm doing two eaters, this is a beautiful, straight, blemish-free bit of wood that has the right thickness throughout. I could fit back-to-back -back eaters here quite easily. So if we mark where the center line is, that right there. So, and the other important thing is that this doesn't have any deep check marks on either side. But either way, the bowl is going to be in here. So again, start low, walk my way up to that line I want to hit, and then chase that line down. Now, before that crack goes any further, flip it around and stop it with a, a, a deep, steep cut, just like that. Um, and now, split the handle in half. I do the first half, coming down to the deepest point of that cut. And getting real gentle as I get down to the bottom here. If I go too hard and this chatters through and hits the face here, it creates this crack in here that I then have to eliminate, and that would compromise my ability to get two spoons out of this piece of wood. So, and in general, I would say don't try going up close to the end of the wood like you're seeing me do here until you're really comfortable with an axe. There's no point in trying to. Uh, get that close to your hands. Just stay further away. You only get one set of fingers. Wood is cheap in comparison. All right. Now, why not? Maybe I'll do pocket spoons for these because these are on the these are on the short side for me. I prefer an eating spoon that's seven and a half, eight inches long, um, because I don't like 
having my hand down in the bowl uh, that I'm eating out of. And I find if the handle's too short, then it's down in the bowl. So we'll see. This one might be long enough for a regular one. We'll see. I'll take a look at it. Either way, whether it's a pocket spoon or a regular spoon, you start off by drawing the bowl. And you'll see that I'm not trying to be too picky about it. What's your question there? Chad, how does poplar and maple compare to cherry for carving? So poplar's soft and it's pretty good. It doesn't take a super nice finish. Um, maple takes a very nice finish, but it's hard. I would say if it's what you got, carve it for sure. Um, the reason I carve cherry and why I go out of my way to get really nice cherry is that of all the woods around me, it is by far the, takes the crispest finish with the least amount of effort. Um, could I get as crisp a finish with maple? Yeah, but it's a lot harder on my hands and on my knives. Um, could I get uh, as crisp a finish with birch? Not so much, even though it's, so it's softer, but it's also more finicky. It tends to have hairs and things like that. So on this one, when I'm doing a pocket spoon, uh, trick with the pocket spoon is just to go from the widest point and then go down however at whatever angle you you want to do. And I guess with this one I'm going to do have a longish a longish one. Um, and the nice thing about that is that I've eliminated having to do this cut at the end and at the end here and instead of having to do two cuts which I would have to do if I hadn't put these right nose to nose I can just do one cut. So in terms of efficiency I've made this just about as efficient as I can get. Ooh, that one's okay. Okay, last saw that I haven't talked about yet is a silky. Um, now this is a slightly different silky than your gomboy or whatever. This uh, this one had was advertised as having uh, an aggressive cut, and they're right. It is very aggressive. Um, which sometimes is nice and sometimes means that it's uh, a little hard to get started and a little chattery. Uh, and by chattery, I just mean it's like a, there's like more vibration, which can be a problem if you're trying to hold on to a, you know, a, a small piece of wood. I wouldn't choose this saw if I was doing a, a scoop or something, or if I was, I wouldn't hand this to, saw to somebody who was just learning how to use a saw like this. Is it faster than these other ones? Not appreciably. I will say the the quality of the mechanisms feels the, the cleanest and the smoothest. Um, but it does have these little bumps here, which I think maybe if you were, you know, if all you were doing was cutting saplings, it would be comfortable. But because my hand is dancing all over the place, sometimes it lands just right in these little finger bumps, and sometimes it doesn't, and it doesn't feel so good. So, uh, I don't know. I am going to go... Just to round out the collection, I am going to go back and get a uh, one of the finer tooth silkies, just to see how much is silky as a brand and how much is just the fact that this is, you know, an especially aggressive tooth one. Uh, but I would say, and you can see how, you know, this doesn't have the the hook on the end that this one does, and there are times when it's just if I'm if I'm trying to use this. A small saw to really cut through a big saw. It's less fatiguing on your hand. You can really loosen your fingers and let the, your pinky finger hook in here and just go and go and go and go and go. Whereas with this, you really would have to grip it in order to get it to, to pull it back. So uh, having that hook at the, the end is useful, which the Baco doesn't have, I should say, um, but the ARS does have as well. So those are the, the five saws that I have right now keep you posted on how they do. Um, again, keep the questions coming, guys, but if I don't see your question, I'm, I'm awfully sorry. Uh, feel free to post it again. I, I don't have a problem answering any questions if I don't answer your questions because I didn't see it. All right, so you see how I'm able to split down the sides of these handles, and you see how much axing effort that saves me. Even when I still need to do a little bit on the side here, it's just less. All right, so you see how I'm, how I was holding myself back as I was popping out those little bits, and how I'm dividing the handle up 
into sections, starting low and working my way up and gradually smoothing out that shape that I want as I go. So that I'm, by the end here, I'm just making little shavy cuts. Now with these shavy cuts, you still have to make sure that that edge engages, because if it doesn't engage, you're in danger of having it skitter down and knock into the shoulder and then put a crack in the shoulder of the bowl of your spoon. So it's all about edge engagement every single time, consistent edge engagement. And the edge engagement comes from torquing the axe. And if the axe has that dip in the handle, I didn't understand this. For a long time, I thought that dip in the handle was showy and I didn't, I don't know, just aesthetically, I didn't like it. But it really serves an important function. You can see how easily this does that. Um, and so, I, you know, that is a new thing that I've realized recently, but uh, it's not just to be showy and flashy. It really does serve an important purpose. And for anyone considering, you know, the Grantford Brooks wildlife hatchet versus this, um, I would say uh, I know the wildlife hatchet is less expensive, so if that's a major concern, then go with that. And I'm always a fan of something that's cheap, but uh, I will say I, I don't, I don't think a wildlife hatchet has this handle that curves like this, so that you get the the balance of the weight. I think, you know, if if you were gonna do a lot of this, or if you suffer from, you know, aggravated stress to your wrist from axing, then getting an axe that has a center of balance like this would probably be helpful. I'm looking to replacing your old saw. It's been used well. Yeah, of course. Well, that's, you know, that's exactly why I decided uh, to get a bunch of these saws. I realized I needed some extra saws for when I'm teaching at the Adirondack Folk School and at Snow Farm. This summer, I'm teaching workshops with up to eight people in them, and so I needed en enough saws that everyone could be going at sawing at once, basically. Um, and uh, so I decided to buy instead of just buying my same favorite saw, I decided to buy a whole bunch of different saws so that I'd be more informed. So I'm glad you get the benefit of that too. Okay, with the pocket spoon. Um, uh, because the pocket spoon really doesn't have a neck and because the grain is sort of flowing from the head down to the handle, it's a style of carving or axing out the blank that's much more akin to what they do in England, where it tends to be widest at the neck right up until the last minute, and then they'll ax down into the neck they'll have already brought down the tip of the bowl and the tip of the handle down to their finished sizes at that point. Um, and here, that's what I've done. Um, kind of axe is this. This is a Grantrus Brooks carving axe. Uh, they are expensive. I would probably not have bought myself this axe. Um, and somebody very kindly sent this to me. And I'm so glad they did because I, I would not have... Uh, <laughs> I would not have had the, the stamina to pay the price that they asked. I've, I've looked at it many times and thought, ah, it's not worth it. And I'm here to tell you, uh, it actually is worth it. And so, thank you, Brian Dunbar, for sending me this axe. I really owe you. Alright, so now doing the back of the bowl um, and then I'm just knocking these corners off. Like I said, this style is, is much more similar to what you would see on YouTube of almost everybody else in terms of axing in their blanks. And then at this point, people would tend to go and they would ax in the crank at this point and then they'd bring in the neck. Um, but because it's a pocket spoon, Whatever kind of spoon you want to call this, 